I'm out at the field this late afternoon. I'm going to focus on doing some catch-up work on collecting, harvesting tomatoes. Sasha's making ketchup and some other stuff, so it's a ketchup catch-up, I suppose. And we've been harvesting quite a bit. You can see there's been a significant commitment to tomatoes this year, based mainly on the idea that I started a bunch of tomatoes that Sasha had saved seed from in years past, and they all sprouted, and they all got into a really weird place where they weren't exactly ready for the field. They had some weird stringy issues, but I committed myself to getting through that and having them be alive and they all lived so we made the trellising to support all those plants so i'm going to talk a little bit about some of the different systems we're using for uh, supporting and trellising these tomatoes some different companion plants that we're experimenting with and what the yield has looked like so far it's a lot of tomato for a family that doesn't sell tomatoes but what we've been doing is we pair with our friend joe who is this lovely uh, farming friend of ours who lives in Freeville and he is doing Geomatoes tomatoes at the local Freeville farmers market And so he's been harvesting certain rounds of these tomatoes Then Sasha and I harvest around then Juan harvests some to uh, process with friends of his And so it ends up being that we've got these tomatoes for our community more so than just a market scenario But the goal was to see how much could we grow and it seems it turns out to be a lot It's an opportunity to trial a few different systems. We did the standard T-posts driven in and kind of a rough approximation of the Florida weave. You can see we would have done well to put more posts in between the plants. It should have been every two or three plants, not every four or five, especially with the big bombadils like pink brandywine. They just need so much support. But we also trialed something this year that felt extremely, or still is actively feeling extremely promising, which is the same basic post infrastructure of good sturdy t-posts these happen to be six foot t-posts because that's what i got a mountain of uh for two dollars a piece on facebook marketplace a bunch of years ago and then in between we've got locust staves hidden in here now you can see just tucked in as every five feet uh, like an inter post scenario and then another post here the idea is this will be a more permanent uh, solution here or at least a few year solution this goes all the way down the line big metal post, inner post with a uh, stave, and then we ran across the top 17 gauge uh, fencing wire, really as taut as we could, you can see that's this here, and then onto that we've connected Hordanova netting, that is this uh, plastic netting here, which is normally considered a disposable netting uh, for either keeping um, creatures off of things, like a very simple fencing, um, or a trellis for climbing crops that you then kind of toss at the end of the season. I'd like to see how many years we can get out of it. And I'll tell you, with the 17 gauge wire across the top as the support for the sagging and the weight of this, because it's not really meant to hold an immense amount of crop, this material is doing a great job at trellising lots and lots of tomatoes. Like for example, right here, that's a lot of tomatoes happening. We've been harvesting for a while. We pruned everything up off the ground. And rather than being diligent about uh, pinching internodes and shaping and doing all that, we basically, as the tomatoes grow, wherever there's a gap in this fencing, we just kind of weave them through and let them keep on growing. So we're getting maximum tomato minimum pruning. And I could see this biting us in the butt at some point because uh, the plants are overlapping one another now, but this field gets an immense amount of sun and really, really good airflow and we focused on fertility. All of these beds have been side dressed with compost. You can see as I do mowing, I liberally apply grass clipping so that the moisture in the soil is extremely even. Even though we've been dry for the last month or two, we have no cracking in the tomatoes because the soil has been really protected. And I even went through and added uh, some crushed oyster shell to provide some free choice calcium to the plants. And so they're growing really, really well. A lot of plants have succumbed to blight in this area uh, this season, but for not irrigating at all, no spray, no real pruning management, just a good robust trellising system and a commitment to taking loose shoots. So for example, I'll take that and weave it right through there and let that fill out. Doing that repeatedly and steadily seems to be translating into some really nice yields. So that same basic layout of a larger metal post and then an interpost of wood, same metal post is five feet or so between each of them. And um, this heavy duty cotton line. So this is all biodegradable and in the fall we can just snip and let everything return to the earth. 
and so theoretically that makes life a lot easier, but it ended up being quite a bit somehow more work of kind of getting the tomatoes in line and pinching them together, and now that they're about three feet high, we need to maybe run another line, and there's a couple spots where we accidentally nipped the line throughout the season or it snapped under the load anyway. I'm not going to complain, we're still uh, looking at a really nice crop here. So like for example, this is all Jean Flamme, which is a French type that Sasha really enjoys. We've been saving seed for almost a decade on these. Really juicy and flavorful and rich. Makes a nice sauce. And you can see these beautiful clusters forming in here. This is be what I'm harvesting, is the really ripe stuff. But there's a fragility here in the way the string is sagging and flopping over. There's a few spots where they lost their control. It doesn't look too bad. I'm not going to say it's bad, but that Hordanova stuff, if we can use it for three to five years or so, definitely feels superior over having to do this sort of weaving every single season. We've got another section here. These are all San Marzano, which I think are more of a determinant paste tomato. We thought maybe we can get away with just planting them and letting them lay on the ground, and then we'll harvest as we go. The voles were very clear that if you do not trellis tomatoes in this landscape, every single fruit that's anywhere near ripe will get eaten. So we pounded in these stakes as an afterthought, so these will all get pulled in the fall. I'm, I'm looking towards a future where we have more permanent scaffolding infrastructure in this field for climbing crops that we can work with every year rather than pulling them all and then starting again. But this one, it was kind of like mid-season, we had to work around other plants. Um, but really glad we did. Juan and Joe worked on this to get these plants off the ground. They're a little ways out from ripening, but it's a um, beautifully solid amount of fruits they're trying to make, and it just goes on for quite a while. These are from starts that we got from our friend Daniel at Countryside Market in Interlake, and you can see these clusters in here. Probably another three to five days, maybe a week, and we should have um, a bushel or two of canning tomatoes here. So these will be ones that we'll harvest uh, Juan and Sasha and I for our canning purposes, and we'll try to prioritize the ones that have a really nice look and fresh eating flavor for Joe to harvest for his desires for the market. A really nice cooperative way of sharing the work and the yields. I'm not sure what it is about this growing season, but something, the, the annual cropping bug bit me in a way where I really wanted to get much better at understanding things like carrots and cabbages and doing onions for storage and hot peppers and sweet peppers and tomatoes. And it's really working. It's nice to apply the skills and knowledge of doing propagation work for nursery purposes and uh, focus that on crops that provide a yield within the season. So by no means am I thinking, oh, I'm losing interest and don't want to do nursery work, but I love the idea of the yes and. And so we've got some beds here that have some cool integrated aspects that I'm feeling really great about. Like for example, here we've got leeks that we've, uh, we started from seed and we transplanted out this spring. We're hoping that they'll be able to stay here until it's cool enough to lift them and put them directly into moist media in the root cellar. So there's an annual, but it's on the southern edge and it's acting as a boundary plant, uh, kind of designing the protection from rabbits there. But then to add some more complexity and scratch the itch of both annual and nursery in the same bed, the leeks are providing kind of a little bit of a wall from the rabbits that are coming through this field. So the interior can be our lovely friends, the hazelnut seedling. And we've just opened up our inventory for fall sales on September 1st and have sold an immense amount of these plants. And so now it's this fun moment in the season where we have to kind of keep the deer and the rabbits from eating these plants until the fall when we can dig them. But here they are nestled and tucked in between the annual crop of the leeks and then on the north, the annual crop of the tomatoes. We found both deer and rabbits do not seem to express much interest in these plants. This is another example of the trellising we probably will not do again. It's a little bit anemic here for the amount of uh, fruit load that these are offering, but we've got hazelnuts, we've got figs, and we've got pomegranates, elderberries, and red currants in the center of the bed, and allium in the form of leek as our southern bound and tomatoes to the north. And so we're trying to understand more and more what it looks like to integrate these cropping systems. It feels like it can absolutely work. Uh, you just have to be on top of things, and in particular, the sprawling annuals, the tomatoes, the uh, sweet peppers, those sorts of plants that are amazing but also sprawl a lot, they're the ones that you need to have to keep in check. So we've been trying to keep them on the wire and also prune them whenever they're getting in the way of the hazelnuts and the figs, but 
Nature's pretty good about partitioning resources, and so far it's working really well that in a three-foot bed we've got a good handful of figs, probably a hundred hazelnuts, a hundred plus leeks for winter storage, and lots and lots of these nice bright lemon boy canning tomatoes that I'll be harvesting shortly. That picture goes on and on throughout here. Like for example, this bed has Hungarian hot wax, wax peppers on the south end, pretty straight, straightforward. Ground cover of sweet potatoes sprawling in and amongst through there. So we'll dig for those sweet potatoes when we go to dig out these peppers. I'm gonna try an experiment of heading them back really hard in the late fall before the first frost and communally healing them in in our root cellar so we can regrow them next year. But that's annuals with annuals. And then a transition starts to happen here where we have the hot peppers, but then we also have second year English walnuts. So these are Carpathian walnuts, Juglans regia. Beautiful, beautiful field ready plants for local people, two to three foot tall plants. And yes, they exude jug juglone, so it'd be influential on the crops growing around them. But the field is really rich and the annuals get lots of mulch around them. So we can have these young forest canopy aspects interplanted within the annuals and still have it work. So San Marzano tomatoes trellis on the north of this bed and then cayenne pepper with a little bit of a gentle overstory of an English walnut seedling, some weeds in there. And then back to cayenne pepper, cayenne pepper, some tomatoes and some really beautiful English walnut seedlings. So why not? Let's see what these plants look like together. We're going to get some high value, financial value from our nursery aspirations in here and definitely get some hot sauce and some canned tomatoes too from the same bed. Just like I've shown before where we have uh, rooted sea berry cuttings that are growing. These will be for local people as bare root plants because they get quite taller than would fit in a box. And there's quite a number of rooted female sea berries in here that fix an ample amount of nitrogen and you can see the brassicas growing. So here's new suckering sea berry. We need to keep an eye out and promote those. So we'll take the cabbages, we'll harvest the kale, we'll harvest the gorgeous giant cabbages that are just being flooded with beautiful nitrogen. They're really hungry plants and they're being provided excess from sea berry. So wanting to get deeper and deeper into annual cropping in the form of sweet peppers and cabbages and onions and the like, mixing them with the nursery work we need to do for our financial picture, man, they absolutely work together and it's a joy to see them hanging out. I also need to remember that we are a working farm, so I need to get back to work. Uh, I'm gonna harvest tomatoes this evening. I'll take a quick shot or two of what the harvest looks like today from hot peppers, sweet peppers, and tomatoes. And we're gonna check in with Sasha about what we can do to make some time to film her doing the magic she does. She, we'll see if we can create the bandwidth for that. It is hard trying to make time in our tiny little kitchen when we're on the fly in between her uh, feeding Zelda and taking naps with her as needed to also film and edit, but uh, we know there's interest there, so we're gonna see what we can do to make that happen. Could have done the more showy thing of showing tomatoes in the beautiful light out in the field, but they're in the car, I'm gonna leave them in the car. Uh, a couple different varieties of cherry tomatoes, really flavorful, they're so helpful in making a deep, rich um, ketchup sauce. These are lemon boys, and that's all Jean Flamme. That's the pick from today from this field. We have other stuff from our home in the garage. Uh, we're getting about a bushel of tomatoes every three to five days right now from the system, and that feels good enough for us for sure. To me, it's really rewarding to remember that if you are focusing on bringing organic matter deposition into a farm field context as a regular basis thing. So harvesting, if it's gonna get mowed, to harvest all that and send it to the plants. If there's old bales of hay that are unsprayed, to send it to the plants, to send it to the soil. Wood chips are available in the area. Say yes and send it in. Leaf bags in the fall, sure, that sounds great. Compost, for sure. And enough of that with plants planted pretty close together uh, seems to be just fine enough to avoid needing any sort of plastic for mulch. Clearly there's no plastic in here for weed suppression at all, ever. Uh, the only plastic we're using in this field is the Hordenova fencing, so maybe that could be replaced with 2x4 welded wire or cattle panel fence, what have you, but if it can last for a bunch of years, I'm happy with it. Um, but this is what it looks like to be growing plants with absolutely no um, plastic involved in weed suppression and no plastic involved in irrigation. 
we do not come out and water these plants. The, the soil itself is pretty decent in this field. We are in a bottomland agricultural context here uh, as a default, but the deep mulch, the high density, high diversity, the windbreak of some taller elements throughout here all confer really good protection from desiccation. And these plants are growing just fine enough with big piles of grass clippings and uh, old manure and that kind of stuff, and it's working out pretty nicely. I'd love to hear from the community. I know there's tons of farmers out there that really understand this stuff way, way deeper than than we do, have may more, uh, way more years on us on this. Hordenova fencing. Have uh, any of you out there used this extensively for tomatoes, for other climbing crops? What are your thoughts, pros and cons? Can we use it for a bunch of years in a row in situ, or does it make sense to bring it in each winter? I'd love to leave it out, just clean the vines out and start from scratch again next year. But share your experience. How's that working for you? Thanks for watching.